super hyped to show you guys this interview with Stephen McDonald. Some projects that you can find his music on are Space Jam, Godzilla, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, The Valorant, Elder Scrolls, and a lot of TV shows including Tough as Nails, In Search of, Homestead Rescue, 60 Days In. And he breaks down a lot of different information that really can provide value to anybody trying to get into this lane. I've also dropped a link below where you can listen to Steven's work as well as some tracks that he's composed for different projects. If you're new to the channel, I go by Excalibur Zero. I help musicians become self-employed by building a back-end stream of revenue through sync licensing and royalty checks while building credibility. If you find value in this video, please be sure to drop a like and I've included time code notes below for you to easily reference and take notes from. Welcome to the, the podcast and I appreciate you coming through and uh, um, I've known you for a, a while now. I've known of you for a while now. I remember when you first actually started um, submitting to Signature Tracks. I was with Jaime, who's the VP of Signature Tracks. And he basically told me he had a new guy that he just brought on. He found you on YouTube. And I'm sure you're going to be able to tell your, your, your version of the story a lot better. And he was just really excited to, to help you out. And I remember he was sitting and helping you, like just breaking everything down and showing you the ins and outs of sync licensing and stuff like that. So do you want to go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got started with music and your journey starting off with sync licensing? Oh, uh, yeah. So I'm Stephen McDonald. Um, just uh, as far as... You know, like my background in music goes, I was a band nerd in high school, play clarinet, got one right here still, um, nice. got back into it recently, uh, started when I was about 18, wanting to write for like concert band and stuff for live performers and uh, started goofing around with that and, you know, notation and all that. And then I, someone, my guest composer came by our school, showed me sample libraries and I was like, wow, sample libraries are freaking cool. But that was right. like 2010 when they weren't even that good yet. Um not compared to what they are now. Oh, yeah, and, definitely. Uh, yeah. So from there, I just started kind of producing my own music just for fun, putting it on YouTube. It was all video game stuff. Um, I would make like Halo 5 fan made soundtrack and stuff, you know, and like upload it to YouTube just because just that's what I like. I like video games. I like music. That's kind of where I got started. And that's where I would like to end up is doing music for games. Um, nice. Started putting that stuff on YouTube, not, you know, not doing anything with it. It's all just kind of free music out there. And then, Got an email one day from a guy, Jaime, um, from Signature Tracks. And, and, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, eh, there's no way this is like a real thing, right? Right. And, but uh, he was real transparent with me. He hopped on the phone with me, which was a good sign. And just kind of explained that they were, you know, they have this music library, um, a lot of pop and hip hop composers, writers in there. And they're needing help fleshing out the more, uh, the cinematic side, as we call right. it, the more orchestral or just kind of modern film score genres you know not not so much radio stuff um and so that was the like the real start of it and i didn't know anything about the business at this time so like being kind of asked like hey why don't you just try writing like five tracks a week and see where it goes from there i was like oh my god i have a job uh but okay sure i didn't <laughs> right i i stuck with it just because i it seemed like I, I never planned on like making a living out of music. It didn't seem like anything that was really possible. That's why I didn't even, I didn't even major in music when I went to college. I majored in film, mm -hmm. which is not, which wasn't a better decision financially. It was still dumb, but <laughs> I didn't think there was any way I would be able to make any money off music. So um, I just, you know, after like a year of doing that five tracks a week, um, I started to finally see some royalty checks come in. They were, they weren't very good. They were low still, but that was kind of like an affirmation, like, okay, so the system works. Um, now I just got to keep building the momentum. And uh, that was, so that was 2014 when I started and 20, uh, I guess 2018 was my first year of going full-time. Um, nice. No job. Yeah. So congratulations on that. Yeah. And, and shout out to Jaime. Jaime is a great guy, man. Like Jaime definitely is a big mentor in my life. He, uh, yes. he definitely motivates me to get better and he's a great composer as well. He's definitely one of those people who, started off like from the bottom and worked his way up and, 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 you know, has a lot of talent. So it's cool that he brought you on. I remember, like I said, I remember when he first brought you on, I was getting trained by him doing like the admin stuff. And I started in 2014. So I remember seeing, like I said, remember seeing the beginning and, and just seeing you consistently turn in those tracks, like you said, those five a week. And the fact that you did that while you managed to have a job still is very impressive. What were some things that like, how did you manage to be able to make those tracks consistently? Cause I feel like cinematic tracks take a lot more work as far as com like composing like hip hop tracks and stuff like that is more like a formula. How did you uh, manage to make the time for that, especially with dealing with the family now? I know you have a daughter and stuff like that. So how did you find the time to do that? 
So, yeah, I mean, it's funny you say that about cinematic music, where, like, for me at this point, I've written so many epic orchestral drama tracks that I'm just like, sometimes I'm just like, my eyes are closed. <laughs> it's, it just feels like, uh, I I mean, it's, it really, it comes down to a science. And for me, if, if I get asked to write, like, a, you know, a convincing pop or hip hop track, I'm like, uh, <laughs> hold on, <laughs> you know? Right. So, you know, it just goes, I guess it goes both ways. I, I, that's the genre I'm used to. I, I grew up around big ensembles. Uh, I, we didn't have an orchestra in my high school, but we had concert band wind ensemble, which was close enough. You know, just no, I wasn't around strings a lot, but right. I knew what big ensembles sounded like. I kind of had an idea of what their parts would be like. And um, to to get to that speed, it was really just, I, I mean, I, I wish there was like, there's no, there's no magic trick. Unfortunately, it was just kind of grinding it out at first. And I don't think I ever still felt like, overworked like oh this is too much Hmm. Um, i had to really just kind of train myself to be efficient with the time that i did have um right instead of taking a lot of hours just being like how can i cram a ton of work into one hour like um and then i still do that today because it's you know working around a toddler schedule is i mean it's still (laughs) i'm sure you understand it's it's like oh i have an hour here go 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 what can i do in an hour (laughs) yeah Yeah. um so in a lot of that and i know it's it's not possible for everyone. Like my job was just nine to six or whatever, you know, eight hours a day, no weird hours. Um, I was married at the time. Didn't have a kid yet. That was a big thing. When I first started, I did not have the kid. Um, so I did about a year of doing tracks with the full-time job. I would wake up early, like at six and try to get a track done before going to work. I mean, if I did that, if I was successful at that five days a week, then that's all the tracks done, you know, during the week, like my weekends would still be free. Right. My after work hours would still be free. It didn't always work out that way. Um, but that was kind of a goal. Uh, so about after about a year of that, I was able to, like, I saw my very first royalty check. It was $255. I remember. Wow. Right. Or, mm-hmm. And that was like, I was like, wow, this is a year of work. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was, you know, it was a little disheartening at first. Um, but I was like, okay, but I'm going to be getting these every quarter now. So I quit the full-time job and went part-time and, that was, you know, again, not everyone can do that. I also had like, my wife was working at the time too, Mm -hmm. not making a whole lot, um, but she was still working. So, and she was very supportive and encouraging me to just go ahead and make the leap. So I quit that job and found a part-time job instead, working about 20 hours a week, uh, doing somewhat similar work in an office. And I got really lucky that I found a 20 hour a week office job. Um, Did that for two years, had my daughter in the middle of that time, and then, so then it was the end of 2017, I got my first royalty check that was like, okay, I like, I can do this. Like the income will even out now, put it yeah. in notice and beginning of 2018, January, 2018, I, I quit and launched it full time. And at that point, my wife was still working as well. So I was like part-time stay at home dad and part-time composer. And that was where I learned a lot of the, you know, trying to write an entire track during a, a baby nap. Right. (laughs) That's exactly the time that I'm creating music too, as well as when my daughter is napping, especially now during COVID, because, you know, the the toddler are at home way more, Um, you know, you're you're at home way way more. So like finding that time to manage, uh, to make music is is difficult. And and especially during the beginning, like you said, you know, during your job, the fact that you took the time to wake up to stay consistent. Cause like I said, man, I seen the back end of it. I seen the part, like I seen that your music start coming in and seen the process of us updating your music into the library. And I seen the, uh, the music that you, you made start getting placed and it's just crazy how consistent and how well it worked out because of just you staying persistent and, you know, stay on top of that. So I commend you for that. I would ask, what are some of your, you know, more, uh, so what are some of your placements that you achieved so far that you're like really proud of that your favorite, that are your favorite and it can be with TV. And I know now you do trailer music as well. So what are a couple of the favorite ones that you've done? Um, well, just, TV wise, it's hard to, it's hard to pick one placement. Most of all, because I don't know about, them. <laughs> I don't really find out about placements until like, you know, six to nine months later when they're on, on the, the royal stages. statement, it's yeah. like, it's like, Oh, but there was a hundred of them. So uh, just as far as like shows, I mean, I started off doing kind of, I mean, I don't want to disparage reality TV in general, but stuff that I wouldn't watch. It was a lot of stuff that was like, well, I've never watched this. I probably mm-hmm. won't. Um, but then eventually we started getting more opportunities and like, discovery channel and history channel stuff. Um, I'm doing some documentary about like working on documentary tracks for 
uh was it america's war on drugs was a cool one mm-hmm. and um there was something else on discovery that i thought was really cool um recently lately it's been tough as nails which i think is a cool concept for a show super cool like yeah. doing that that whole blue collar work competition stuff um i also yeah like you said, i started i also got into other avenues of library music not just reality tv um as i grew into getting used to the, what the industry is like i started going you know striking out on my own making my own relationships with libraries um one side of that is trailers music for movie and video game trailers mm-hmm. um my favorites have honestly all my favorites have been the video game trailers i've done so far just because i love games so much they're a lower budget but the they're usually they're less competitive they're more relevant to me my probably my absolute favorite one um and it's on my website it was a it was just a trailer for uh, DLC for some expansion content for mm-hmm. the Elder Scrolls Legends, just the Elder Scrolls okay. card game. Yeah, yeah. Which like nobody plays. I think it's dead now. <laughs> but <laughs> right, well, it was, I'm very with it, yeah. And, and it was one of my lowest paying placements, but it was like I got it was custom. I got to write like an orchestral custom track with specific vibes that they wanted, you know, instead of just like they licensed this one, bam. You know, it it was it was a very musical track that I got to write with, you know, with a little melody and some some interesting chords and stuff. It, it was it felt it felt more like I was being a composer and less of like a music factory, you know? Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And can you so, quickly explain the difference between custom and license for people who don't understand? Yeah. So uh, licensed music will mean uh, in the end, it's all licensed. They're all paying for a license. But um, if they're just licensing something from the catalog, from the library, that means they're going into the, the some company like say Ghostwriter is one of the companies I've written for a lot. If they're just going into that catalog and pulling a track that exists, paying to license it that's that would be like a library or catalog placement um a lot of times in trailers they'll ask for things that are custom completely custom from scratch uh, sometimes it's just because they can't find what they want in the library sometimes it's because it's really specific like they'll want a trailerized version of a pop song or right, right. Old, the worst is when it's like they want a trailerized version of like an 80s song that was recorded like not to a click so right. then you're trying to overlay stuff on it and it's just the tempo was all over the place. <laughs> right. Um, there's a lot of that. Um, sometimes it's just completely custom tracks. Like the Elder Scrolls one was they just wanted a custom orchestral track with like these kind of uh, I say ethnic. I don't like I don't like that term, but they were trying to match the the culture of the of the race and universe that the right. expansion was about. And so I got to do some specific orchestral music there. And that was a that was a really cool one. So that's yeah, custom is they ask. And then the library will go to some of their more reliable, faster composers and be like, hey, we need something amazing in two hours. Go. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's, the, that, the that's the exaggerated are version. <laughs> yeah. Are, are crazy. The custom turnarounds are, are crazy. You get a brief and then next thing you know, you need to be making it like now. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. So how did you make that transition from working for a music? Like, so your story pretty much started, you started uploading on YouTube and then you know, obviously high made from signature checks found you. How did you gain that confidence or what direction or how did you really find that new lane to start with this trailer music? Did you go out and search for music libraries? Did you start joining forums? How did you get involved with that community? I think with trailers, I think it was a case of like, I just, I like trailers. I'm kind of a, I love hype. I love, (laughs) I I eat up marketing stuff like that. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know how many times there are trailers that are cooler than the movies that actually actually came out. And I think it was a case of like, I saw some trailers and would be like, man, that music was cool. And just try to Google like a uh, Star Trek uh, beyond trailer music. Right. And see if I can find it on YouTube and, and then I'll find someone has uploaded it and I'll look in the description and be like, what is this? It's uh, this track by really slow motion. What's, what's that? And then I'll, and then I would, I looked up like really slow motion. That was probably the first one I found. And that's I cool. discovered there's like, Oh, these are music libraries. Like that's like what I'm already doing, but right. it's kind of like, it's a lot more competitive and I, I don't want to, and again, it, I say all this, not disparaging reality TV, reality TV demands a lot of music and it becomes a quantity game. At some point, you obviously have to know how to, to write to brief. You have to be able to put out quality stuff, but you know, they want lots of music. And so it's kind of like a lot of small placements, whereas with trailer music, they want like cutting edge, top of the line production stuff for one big license, you know, for right. one big, like $20,000 license. So it was a it was a whole different ball game trying to train myself to get in, into that. And that was with trailer music. I'm not waking up at six and finishing a track before eight. I'm not, that's, that doesn't happen with trailer music. That's a lot more intensive. And so that just came from research and a lot of 
information I've gained about the trailer industry has come from like Facebook groups. There's mm. a couple of really good Facebook groups on library music and trailer music specifically. Uh, I've made some good friends there. Um, people I talk to regularly now and nice. some of the people I met when I went down to LA, like I was telling you about in 2019. Right. Is there anything that you recommend from the Facebook groups for anybody who's trying to get down this lane? Oh uh, yeah. So there's one called a, it's called a composer's guide to library music mm-hmm. discussion, I think is the name of the group is there's a book from uh, Dan Graham. He owns okay. goth, he owns Gothic storm and uh, several other labels uh, called the harmony music libraries. Um, he's well established been in the business forever. He runs these libraries and he wrote a book and then like he made a Facebook group to discuss that book and just the business in general. That one's been really good. Um, and then there's one, the trailer music composers support group. These mm-hmm. are both on Facebook for trailer music stuff specifically. And yeah, just a lot of info to be gleaned from like reading those discussions that have happened, watching new questions pop up. There's, there's industry veterans in there answering questions, nice people, supportive atmosphere. That's, that's been a big source of knowledge for me. Just, just kind of lurking in those areas, participating a little bit myself too. Nice. And I, I noticed that you, you very much so participate in the discord community that we created. And I appreciate that because I feel like community is very important with this lane and everybody's trying to, you know, help each other get to that next level and, you know, really create an opportunity for themselves to have a full-time job from this. You know, I think at the end of the day, we, we want to create music and not be binded down to working a job that we don't want to do while, mm-hmm. you know, we have music on our mind all day. So I, I definitely appreciate that part of you. And, I, you know, I, I thank you for sharing that as well, because uh, I feel like community based, especially with the, this music game is very important. So thank you for that. When you start your music for, um, you know, let's say, let's say you start your, your music for reality TV. We'll go with that one first. What's kind of your process look like as far as how you go about having the mindset to knock out a track? So let's say 6 a.m., uh, you know, 2017, Stephen, what was his mindset going into that? And how did you kind of structure your day around that? Uh, and the mindset really is just do it, get started. Cause like looking at, looking at an empty doll project session is just like, Oh, yeah, that it sucks. Like starting, starting track is the worst part. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's usually about just like getting an idea down as fast as possible. And, uh, depending on the, depending on the genre, like I, I see one of the questions here, I'm, I'm kind of like grouping this question in with this other one that you asked uh, right. about like starting a track What's the process, like starting one. Um, as far as like actually the work that goes into it, the important thing to me is first identifying what is the important part of the track. So if I get a brief for orchestral drama, um, then, okay. With orchestra, it's a very musical ensemble. So I'm going to go straight to the musical aspect of it. So I'll like, just get my piano, load up a piano patch, find something interesting, find some, go to some, you know, go to some chords. I know work noodle around with some melodies on, on the piano. And it's like, okay, I have an idea and then go and start translating it to orchestra. Um, Mm -hmm. If it was something like, so I'm trying to think one specifically that we've done is like pirate themed, like hip hop stuff, you know, like, like deck and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, So if it's like pirate stuff, like, okay, I've heard references. I, I can think like, Oh, pirates of the Caribbean. That's the thing everyone goes to. And I, I know how to, to build a track like that. Um, but since it's hip, the hip hop thing is, is important. I might start with the beat, like start with right. some good solid drums first and then go lay down my, you know, formulaic um, idiomatic pirate stuff on top of it. <laughs> so identifying like, what is the important part? And, and so for, if it was trailer music, they wanted, if, if I was trying to do a synthetic electronic industrial sound design, heavy trailer track, I wouldn't start with the piano because there's not a ton of like traditional musicality to those. Mm. I would start by trying to create some kind of like signature sound, some kind of hook, some kind of, you know, I would like open up a like serum or something and start making some disgusting sounds and being like, Oh, that's a cool, that's a cool signature sound. Okay. Save that, record it. Now start building now like, okay, now it needs some movement. So then I'll start playing with pulses or drum rhythms, you know? Right. Um, yeah. So really like to, to boil, like to, to, sum it all up is identifying the important element of the track that you're writing, starting with that and then building around that would be at the beat or the chord progression or just a sound. Yeah. That was going to be my next question. If you kind of started it out, like 
uh, like as an eight bar loop, I know for like hip hop, usually we just do like a little loop where it's like the hook section. And then we just kind of strip it out from that point. Is that kind of how the approach that you have with it? Or is it kind of move and go as you, as you create it? I, I would say, yeah. I mean, there, there are cases where it doesn't happen often in library music. Um, sometimes somebody will want like something with a big sweeping melody. Mm-hmm. It doesn't happen that often. I, a lot of the times this, this stuff is just kind of like a rhythmic tonal bed underneath dialogue. You know? Right. And even for orchestral cinematic music, often that does start with a, with a loop, like you're saying, like a kind of an eight bar idea. I'm like, okay, here's a good A section. So now here's how I'm going to build onto it. And I, th- I think the difference is a lot of times with hip hop and pop, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here. A lot of that development happens in, in the like adding and removing of elements, layers, mm-hmm. transitions, that kind of stuff where I might think more like, okay, repeat this, but the melody is going to go higher this time. Mm-hmm. And then the trombones are going to have a big stab here under this big important part. You know, like there is still, some, you still have your copy and paste, your kind of loop based composing going on, even in orchestral music. Um, some people don't like it. Some people might disparage it and like, blah, chase me out of here with the pitchfork, but <laughs> it, it, it is what it is. You know, sometimes yeah. you just have to get it done. And like nine times out of 10, that works because no one's looking for like this crazy epic, you know, classical melodic suite for their, for their underscore. That's, that's right. just how it is. Like, for sure. I, I know what I'm doing is simplified and kind of, kind of dumbed down, but it is still a, a process and a skill to, to dumb things down enough to be efficient and work. I, I would, I wouldn't even consider you dumbing it down. I think you just have a sp- certain, certain scenes and certain movies and certain projects and certain TV shows and all that stuff just require a specific sound and being able to adapt to that is very important. It's not like, I think that the one common mistake that I made when I first started sending music out for TV is thinking that I need to like make it cheesy or make it sound a specific way when in reality it's learning how the sound for that, specific show or specific scene is and then kind of adapting my song with it. So I think that what you're doing is great, man. You, you definitely bring musicality to it. And you know, that the fact that you're in band, I, I was in band myself too, as well as in concert band. And then I what ended up being in a marching band too, as well. So the marching fact band you, was my big thing. Yeah. yeah the fact yeah. that you think that way is, is awesome. Cause you, you like the way you were just explaining how, you know, like the whole, the trombones and stuff like that, the, the stabs and stuff like that is just, I was just thinking he has that, that, that type of the, you know, the, the tra- traditional band thinking way of, you know, composing. So it's pretty cool to seeing that. What are like, when you have, um, let's say, let's say you're making music for TV or you're making music for a trailer, either or, what are your, some of your favorite sounds that you go to as far as like um, VSTs or, you know, any plugins that you like? Okay. So the, uh, the classic, my, my desert Island, like plugin would probably just be uh omnisphere, which okay. I think like 80, at least 80% of people doing, what I do would probably agree <laughs> there. Right, I don't know if, I don't know if you use Omnisphere in your stuff. I know Jaime, Jaime actually bought me Omnisphere. Like I back remember when that. I was, yeah. Back when I, I was like that. poor and I was like, I don't have anything. Dude. I remember telling <laughs> but, me that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so shout out to, shout out to Jaime. Um, yeah. Omnisphere is kind of my go-to for all kinds of those like synth sounds or like organic based synth sounds. Cause it's, you know, it's a synth and a sampler at the same time. So you, mm-hmm. you know, you're my, you're layering like, somebody tapping on a glass like test tube with a synth pluck, you know, to create some right. of these sounds. And so you can get, it's a good way to get synths that are organic um, in nature. Like they, you know, organic sounds that are used like synths used like arps and stuff like that. Um, when it comes to orchestra, I'm kind of, I, I'm like, I, I do a lot of, dumb, like I said, dumb, like I say, dumbed down, simplified stuff. I like, I like ensemble patches. I like anything that gives me good, like full strings all the way across the keyboard. Mm-hmm. I know that's if I was writing something for live performance, I would not start that way. Cause that just, right, right. Of, yeah, it just makes orchestration a nightmare. Um, but I'm not in this case, I'm writing finished products here in two hours. So it's like, I like my ensemble patches stuff. Like um, I, I used to use Albion one quite a bit from Spitfire. I haven't as much lately. I've been, I've gone more with like performance samples. Fluid shorts is one of my, some of my favorite string staccatos those what i like one of my most used libraries ever okay uh, fluid shorts um the cinematic studio series is also excellent they have they have ensemble patches they have split out instruments they have all the articulations and a nice easy interfaces and i i just got those about a year ago so i have cinematic studio strings brass and woodwinds now nice. um 
and if I was going to do something that is like meant to sound like a live performance or meant to be orchestrated, I would probably go straight to those three libraries because they are all recorded in the same room, same developer, and they cover the full orchestra. Um, percussion wise, you know, heavy acidity stuff. I'm using damage too yeah. all the time. Yeah. Um, uh, my, my favorite brass, all my brass sounds ridiculous because I use trailer brass um, by musical sampling for like everything. Like I probably use it more than I should. Like, it's just like, even you know, I, I have a hard time with like soft brass dynamics. Cause I'm just like, I want to use trailer brass <laughs> all the time just cause it's so like thick and full sounding. I'm right. Like, I'm kind of addicted to that sound. Yeah. Awesome, man. And, um, so what are some, um, placements that you, anybody could really search and, and look up as far as what you've created so far? Like, what can we, I know you just shared one in the discord mm -hmm. of the Valorant one, which was super sick. I love Valorant. My, my brothers play Valorant all the time. So, uh, that, that was pretty cool to see. Yeah. I was like, I was like, this is a, this is a, like an expensive trailer for a skin for like some gun <laughs> skins and stuff. <Right. laughs> like, okay, whatever. I mean, uh, I won't question it. I'm, I'll just take the money and, and be happy. Um, <laughs> Uh, I have a, like, I have a website. Um, you can put it in the description if you want. It's just Stephen And I have a little credits page there that has some of my favorite, like trailer placements where you can actually watch the trailer. Um, I mean, you know, as far as TV, there's no really, not really a good way to like put those online. They're, they're on their broadcast. Uh, I mean, right, some right. of them are online, but it's like, I don't have a cable subscription, so I generally can't go and watch them easily and, or, you know, upload them or anything. So like my website is where you would hear a lot of like a lot of my actual just a sampler of different genres of my music and then some of the placements, some of the context of how some of them get used in trailers. Right. Awesome. So if you're if you could give any advice to a new composer or a music producer, anybody trying to approach a library to get accepted to, whether if, if it's trailer or if it's just, uh, you know, general TV underscore, how would you recommend them approaching and uh, any tips that you would have as far as trying to get accepted? Okay. So there are a couple different ways I've done it in the past. Um, I think probably the most common, like successful way is just, and I know you've talked about this. It's just getting a playlist, you know, three to five of your absolute best tracks that show what you can do. Um, and I know I, I've debated in my head about like range, like, should I get three to five really different tracks mm -hmm. or three to five of just my best, like, you know, top, I think probably going with your best is, it's the best bet. And it, so many libraries function differently because a lot of times with like higher end libraries, like you've talked about, like working with killer tracks before they are going to want specialists who do like, they're going to want you for hip hop, right? Like mm -hmm. they, they, they want, they, they're not, they're not relying on a small amount of people for a ton of different genres. They're relying on like, okay, here's our, here's our cinematic guys. Here's our hip hop guys. So, you know, for libraries like that, you want to send your definitely your specific like here's what i can do like i would send trailer music probably because it's probably my strongest genre um if i was trying to get into libraries like that and you know it's just about sending the email finding the right email um being very careful because sometimes libraries do have specific instructions on how to submit and it can look pretty bad if you miss those instructions and just like send a blind email you know right, <laughs> so for it's sure. like I, I you definitely want to you know you want to do your research before you hit send like look around the website, make sure you're not missing anything. A lot of times they'll have like, if they have like a frequently asked questions section on the website, they might address how to submit. Um, one of the other way, you know, aside from the small playlist, another thing I've done is actually writing an entire album and going to a library and saying, Hey, do you want this full album? Like it's done. You, can, you know, I'll mm -hmm. make changes if you want. Yeah. And it's riskier because, you know, some libraries, some some simply just don't do single writer albums. Some, they, they always come up with their own album ideas, send the brief out and then take tracks from everyone. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where doing your homework can come in handy. Cause I'll always go into a, you know, before I submit a solo album to a library, I will look on their website, go through their albums and see like, okay, are these albums from multiple people or are, are any of these single writer albums? Cause if, if they do have single writer albums, then I know, okay, they will like, they are okay with single writer albums. So they're not going to just throw this in the trash immediately. That's smart. Yeah. That's so I mean, yeah, do your research, look into that kind of stuff for things like those reality TV boutique libraries that, you know, that we like signature tracks that we work with. They, they will generally rely on more. And I, and I, and I think the team's growing there too. So there's less of a thing, but like when I first started, I was doing way more stuff than just my cinematic 
orchestral sound. Um, mm -hmm. Nowadays, I'm, I'm, I get to be a little more focused, but you know, for libraries like that, it might it might actually be good to demonstrate your range so they you know don't know you're like a workhorse composer, a workhorse writer, and less of a you know like orchestra diva or something. You know? Right. I agree with that. I think Signature Tracks actually does a good job with that, where they kind of just uh, they they first they had like a, it was like a, people who had a lot of versatility, but now they're really honing in on these people are good for these type of briefs. These people are good for these type of briefs and they have like, you know, just high quality sounds or high quality music, you know, meeting those, you know, quotas that they have. So I definitely, uh, I definitely agree with what you're recommending is kind of doing your research and figuring out where your sound could really stand out and how you can really benefit from uh, sending it in and seeing if you should be sending, you know, solo albums or, you know, individually. So that's really good advice. Um, yeah. Now, like nowadays from signature, like when I get the briefs, have like pop and hip hop stuff. I'll like play one and be like, no, I can't, I, I can't compete with this anymore. <laughs> like right. I'm, I'm going to stay in my lane. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's how I feel about orchestral, man. I cannot, this, it's just, you guys are just on another level and uh, on, we're on a, a different level, you know, laterally. Yeah. Like this. yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Different lanes. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, man. Well, that, that's pretty much all the questions I have, but I want to go ahead and, add, you know, I, um, let you have a chance to give any closing statements and advice to composers you may have. And what can we look forward to from you as far as the future of what you're doing with your music? Okay. Um, my advice really the, the, like if I had to say one general thing and it's, it's not like a specific, you know, magic trick, you know, tool, how to, how to be successful. It's more of just a, I, I think a lot of composers these days, I, I see it a lot with younger composers kind of put the cart before the horse as far as mm. the whole money and making a living thing. Mm. And, you know, we've all been there. Like you start, you're working a job you, you hate. And it's like, Oh, well, I, I want to make money now. I want to get out of this. But I think a lot of people shoot themselves in the foot by thinking like business first and like craft later or skill later. Um, and like, I've definitely grown in my, like, as I've gone, I mean, when I started, like when I listened to the stuff I wrote back in 2014, that was getting placement still. I'm like, oh God, like, I can't believe I sent that to someone. Right. So like, you know, there's, there's a, a matter of objectivity and, you know, production quality, not always being a huge, huge deal when people are picking music. But I mean, if you want to, I think if you want to be successful and stand out, like th there's so much music out there now, there is an insane amount of composers and producers because the tools are so accessible now. Like we can all do this on a laptop. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, like, and there's the amount of stuff that is free and good these days, even compared to like 2014, when I started, it's kind of insane, like what you can get for free. So the, it, the saturation is, it can be a problem. And if you want to not just be another one of the, the numbers, not, not be on the noise floor, so to speak, like it, it takes work and the, you know, developing your craft, getting better before. And, and if you, if you start just thinking, okay, I'm going to just go for libraries right away get paid, you know, you're, you're going to set yourself up for disappointment. And I think that goes, that kind of goes along with, with, and I know we like to, we like to inspire people that like right. we want people to feel hopeful and stuff, but I think you have to understand like a lot of people try this and don't, mm. and don't make it. And I, and I don't want to like, I don't want to sound like a downer or, you know, I didn't think I would make it. I think there was, there was a lot of luck that came into me making it like, like Jaime finding my music and, you know, managing to contact me, like, I don't know what I would be doing if that hadn't happened. You know, there's right. obviously successes when uh, opportunity meets preparation or whatever that, whoever said that, yeah. uh, Mike, Michael Scott, uh, no, not Michael, <laughs> Scott. <laughs> um, <laughs> Michael Scott, Wayne Gretzky, uh, yeah. uh, um, you know, things have to go right. And you can obviously, you can, you can work really hard to help to increase the likelihood that things go right. But there's always, you know, there are circumstances you might send the best demo of your life to someone to, you know, like an amazing music library, but they just released an album of that like yesterday. So they're just like, mm -hmm. Oh, I don't need this. Not listen to it. There's so many right. things that have to line up. And I think it's a matter of being like, yes, I want this. I'm going to do my best to make this happen. But I think you need to also make sure you're finding your, your, your joy and your peace and other mm -hmm things as well. Like for me, it's my family. You can't really just like look at this as this is my only goal in life. Um, I see that happen with a lot of younger composers that is like, and then, you know, that can lead to a very dark place. 
if you're if your whole like livelihood and joy is coming from the idea of quitting your job one day like it might not happen that's just mm-hmm. the reality of it it's hard it's it's competitive it's hard there's a lot of luck involved and it's getting i think it's getting harder every day the more people that enter the industry so um those are yeah those are the two things uh, get good before you think okay it's time to make money like make sure you're competitive first and to don't don't count on it with all of your all of your life all of your joy like mm-hmm. yeah find other things to be happy about right if it means you know do whatever you can lower your cost of living so maybe you can find a less terrible job um but still make music on the side you know it, it's For sure yeah that's that's the thing with that and i don't like i, said, I don't want to be discouraging I, I want everyone i want everyone to have their success but i think you know it's a it's a capitalist society we live in and not everybody can unfortunately so right. you know some people have to get stepped on for other people to rise to the top and that's it's the unfortunate reality of it but uh, i think if you understand that going into it it can make things a little a little less stressful and you know make it a more enjoyable ride for sure that's actually really good advice so i feel like uh, it's easy to get discouraged in this lane when you're not getting accepted or hearing anything back or you know you, you we kind of pry all of our um like the 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 amount of how good we are, I guess, based on other people's opinions. When, in a matter of fact, it's about how you feel about your music, what your music makes you feel and how you feel when you create it. And I think that it is important having that mindset when going into it, because yes, this lane could definitely change your life. But at the same time, there is a lot of people going down this route, especially now it's getting more popularized. But at the end of the day, if you think about music, I feel like there's so much opportunity out there because music is the forefront of entertainment. Anytime a type of entertainment coming out, whether it's virtual reality, augmented reality, all that stuff is going to be based around, you know, they need, they need music creators out there at the end of the day. So even if you don't have the opportunity to have, you know, your your music on your favorite TV show or movie, it's it's good to be realistic and understand like, you know what, I'm putting in this work now. And somewhere, some way, somehow in the future, it's going to give me an opportunity that helps me progress. But, you know, this might not be for me, like at this very moment. So I definitely respect and appreciate that advice. So what is what is something that we can expect from you in the future? What are some goals that you have with your music? Dude, I, you know, if you see me, if you see Stephen McDonald on like, OK, so the ultimate goal is Halo 7. You know, whatever, whatever's next for Halo. Right. If, I mean, that, that, that's that's my thing. I mean, like this is the one one seven from Halo. I see the this, Master Chief. Yeah. This the yeah, there's Master Chiefs back here. This tattoo is the Halo main theme on a music oh, staff. Oh, that's, my, dope. that's awesome. That, that's what got me into all this was was the music from Halo back in the day. And uh, really, like video games are kind of the next step for me. I feel like I'm I'm super happy where I am. Like I could do this the rest of my life, no mm-hmm. big deal. But if like the the ultimate dream to come true would be i would be doing video game music um as far as sync and library stuff um more trailers i'm always happy to do more trailers you know there isn't really the thing with doing reality tv is you don't really see much of that success so you you're not going to like see my name and credits or anything like that mm-hmm. you might be you might be hearing you're probably hearing my music if you're watching reality tv you're probably hearing some every once in a while but... you are probably watching <laughs> yeah. he's listening yeah. to his music yeah. honestly so you know that that's the thing for me uh, hopefully I hopefully bigger and better things in the form of, of games and not better at better, um, in a very subjective way to me, cause that's, that's what I want to do. Right. Uh, ultimately I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing cause I enjoy it. It affords me a good life and I get to sit here and make music and then go downstairs and have tickle fights with my, with my toddler. So, right. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome, man. It's a great goal to have. And I feel like you, now that you talked about Halo, now I have the, the theme song stuck in my head and just bring about nostalgia. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if I, awesome. if I like anytime there's a new choir sample library, I give it the Halo test. <laughs> that is, that is so hard to, to do that. That like legato chant with mm-hmm. the oh, syllable, like it, there's not a lot of libraries that can pull that off. And that's kind of my, like, if I, if I get that, then I'm like, Oh, this is good. Keeping this. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good standard to have, man. Yeah. All right, man. I appreciate you coming through and we're going to go ahead and enter right there. Thanks man for, uh, you know, coming through and spreading the knowledge. We really appreciate it. It means a lot. And you're definitely helping out, you know, a lot of young generation who's trying to go out there and make an opportunity for themselves. Thanks to everybody who checked out this video. If you're new here, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Until next time, it's your boy Scott Zero, the music producer you can grow with and keep working.